Okay. In the Bahamas, the price of uh, a piece of key lime pie is a dollar and a half. In uh, Puerto Rico, it's two dollars and fifty cents. In Jamaica, it's three dollars and fifty cents. Those are the pie rates of the Caribbean. The pie rates of the Caribbean. Okay, the pie rates of the Caribbean. See, that's not the that's not the movie today. That's just that I've been spending time with my five-year-old grandson, and that's one of the treasures that he shared with me the other day. The pie rates of the Caribbean. Okay. In the Old Testament, when Elisha was the prophet of God, one of Israel's enemies, the king of Aram, was constantly ordering his soldiers to go out and set up ambushes so that they might capture or kill the king of Israel. But each time, Elisha would warn the king of Israel, don't go that way, and he didn't. The king of Aram could not figure out how this was happening. From 2 Kings chapter 6, we read, This enraged the king of Aram. He summoned his officers and demanded of them, Will you not tell me which one of us is on the side of the king of Israel? None of us, my lord the king, said one of his officers. But Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. Go find out where he is, the king ordered so I can send men and capture him. The report came back, he is in Dothan. So the king sent horses and chariots and a strong force there. They went by night and surrounded the city. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots surrounded the city. Oh, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant said. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, O oh Lord, open his eyes so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked, and he saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. The rest of that story is very interesting. If you want to read it later, it's in 2 Kings chapter 6. A little excerpt, though, has little to do with today's message. I just wanted us to hear that so that we, so that we can begin to get our minds right before we see a movie clip and read a passage from Ephesians. When Elisha's servant's eyes were opened, he looked and he saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire. You see, the Lord was enabling him to observe what was taking place in the spiritual realm, a realm that remains invisible to us most of the time if not all of the time. And he saw these horses and chariots of fire, God's angels protecting God's prophet. This very morning, if we could see what is around us, what is taking place in the spiritual realm, we would be in awe. We would probably be freaked out. More than likely, we would be scared senseless. Most of the time, we don't think about stuff like that. We live in what we have determined is reality. And our reality is consumed with what? School, work, relationships, social media, entertainment, dozens of other things that we make our priorities. And in our minds, that spiritual element is often equated with some sort of fantasy sometimes. The Apostle Paul paints a different picture 
than that. In 2 Corinthians 4.18, he's writing to Christians who are in distress and who have trials and who are suffering. And he says, we should fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what, what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. We don't think of it like that very often, do we? This is real. This is permanent. I can touch this. I can feel it. I can see it. I can experience it. This life is the real deal. Paul says it's temporary. What you cannot see that is the permanent stuff. So begin. As we begin this morning, let's get our spiritual minds right, at least so much that we can be aware of the spiritual realm, that which is permanent, that which is unseen. Today's movie is Hacksaw Ridge. What the hell is your delay, Captain? We're waiting, sir. Waiting for what? Private Doss. Who was Private Doss? I always dreamed about being a doctor, but I uh, didn't get much school. I can't stay here while all them go fight for me. But you figure this war is just going to fit in with your ideas? While everybody else is taking life, I'm going to be saving it. And that's going to be my way to serve. This is a personal gift from the United States government designed to bring death to the enemy. Oh, I'm sorry, Sergeant. I can't touch a gun. She don't kill. No, sir. You know, quite a bit of killing does occur in war. Private Doss does not believe in violence. Do not look to him to save you on the battlefield. I don't think this is a question of religion. I think this is cowardice. I fell in love with you because you were like anyone else saying you could go to prison. I don't know how I'm going to live with myself if I don't stay true to what I believe. With the world so set on tearing itself apart, it doesn't seem like such a bad thing to me to want to put a little bit of it back together. Private Doss, you are free to run into the hellfire of battle without a single weapon to protect yourself. You home. There's something you gotta see. Who did this? That's the car. We have to go back up tomorrow. And they're not gonna go up there without you. Help me. You'll have to trust me. You better come home. Let me get one more. Please, Lord, help me get one more. Hacksaw Ridge is based on the true story of Desmond Doss, a United States Army private who served as a combat medic with an infantry company in World War II. He never carried a weapon but was twice awarded the Bronze Star for his performance in Guam and the Philippines. The movie centers on the Battle of Okinawa, where an unarmed private Doss saves the lives of 75 wounded men and subsequently becomes the only conscientious objector to receive the Medal of Honor for his actions during World War II. Many of those 75 that he saved were the same ones who had earlier concluded that he was a coward. That is, until they witnessed him in the heat of battle. That's why in their second assault on that mountain in Okinawa, they refused to go into battle until Doss was finished with his prayer. War is hell. And while I was glad to know the story of Desmond Doss, it's very unpleasant for me 
to watch those realistic battle scenes. And as graphic, graphic as they are sometimes, we know that they don't even begin to scratch the surface of what was the real thing. But when we learn about what happened there on that battlefield, there's no explanation for what Private Doss was able to accomplish other than the intervention of Almighty God. Followers of Jesus are at war. If you're a child of God, if you're a Christian, whether you are aware of it or not, you are engaged in mortal combat. And the degree and, and the degree to which you are unaware of that fact is the degree to which you are failing when it comes to accomplishing your mission. In his letter to the Ephesians, the Apostle Paul writes to us about this war. Ephesians, for me, is the, is the pinnacle of uh, Paul's uh, letters of the New Testament. In, in this short letter, he writes about our royal position in Christ. He tells us that we were dead apart from Christ, but now we are alive because of the cross which has demolished the barriers between us and God and between each other. In Ephesians, he talks about prayer and, and unity and about how we should behave as we imitate Christ. He builds to a spiritual crescendo as he attempts to open our eyes to what is really going on all around us in this world. I wonder if he may have been thinking, like the prophet Elijah, O oh Lord, open their eyes that they may see. As he writes in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. See what he's doing after explaining what it means to be a child of God, he goes militant. He's beginning to describe the militant church. Not the sedated church, not the complacent church, not the atrophied church. And he begins with armor. Take a stand. The devil schemes. Really, he's mirroring Jesus, who once said, Do not suppose that I have come, to bring pe have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Then, like a general in a war room, Paul begins to lay out the strategy Verse 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. More than any other passage in Scripture, this one gives us clear insight into the battlefield. You see, we are to be militants, for the kingdom of God. From the perspective of the kingdom of darkness, we are terrorists, holy warriors. Because when we are advancing against our enemy under the banner of the cross, we strike terror in the heart of the enemy. Now let's be clear. We're not talking about a militancy that sends us out from here to argue with non-believers or to take a militant stand for what is right or to, or to take up what we might consider to be a righteous cause. No, that's not our mission. Christians in this world are operating behind enemy lines and our sole mission is precisely the same as private Doss's. We are to retrieve those who are fallen, who have been wounded by the flaming arrows of our enemy that Paul talks about next. But notice Paul's description. 
Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Too often, militant Christians get this wrong. When we see antichrists like Islam or atheists or anyone who is hostile to Jesus and his followers, sometimes it just makes our blood boil and, and, and we want to take up arms, so to speak, to defend Jesus like those sons, sons of thunder who followed Jesus, James and John. Man, we want to call down fire from heaven. Paul says, uh-uh. Jesus doesn't need defending. He can take care of himself. No, those folks are flesh and blood. They are not the enemy. They are among those wounded ones we should be praying for and trying to retrieve from the clutches of our real enemy. No, our struggle is against someone else. Paul tells us they are rulers, authorities, powers of this dark world, spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. These are classifications or ranks among those in the spiritual realm who are opposing us. And Satan is the commander. It would, be, it would not be inaccurate if we were to change those labels to something like generals and captains, lieutenants, privates. Paul is describing the real enemy with whom we are at war. They are real. They are powerful. But they would prefer that Paul had not written this. They prefer, they prefer that we don't even know about them, that the devil prefers to be anonymous. It was C.S. Lewis in his famous book, The Screwtape Letters, where he depicts a senior demon and his nephew corresponding with one another. In one of those letters to his nephew, Screwtape, the senior demon writes to his nephew concerning the uh, human that he is trying to influence. He writes, I do not think you will have much difficulty in keeping the patient in the dark. The fact that devils are predominantly comic figures in the modern imagination will help you. If any faint suspicion of your existence begins to rise in his mind, suggest to him a picture of something in red tights and persuade him that since he cannot believe in that, therefore he cannot believe in you. In the film, The Usual Suspects, the character Verbal Kent very accurately boils it down to one sentence. He says, the greatest trick the devil ever played was convincing the world he does not exist. That's true. But if our eyes were open so we could see, well, Paul is trying to open our eyes right here. He's warning us of the dangers that are before us as we face our enemy. Our enemy is formidable. And we wouldn't have a chance were it not for the plan of attack that Paul lays out for us right here. Verse 13, therefore put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the blessed breast breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. I'm sure, we, I'm sure you remember the Old Testament uh, account of David and Goliath. Remember how David jumped at the chance to go out against this giant? He was confident, but he was not confident in his own ability or his own might. He was confident because he was going out to defeat an, a, a giant in the name of the Lord. 
Remember how King uh, Saul uh, uh, got David dressed up in, in his own armor with, with good intentions to help uh, David be prepared? David tried to walk around and, and maneuver, but it was three sizes too big. And David said, I can't wear this. I can't go in this. I'm not used to it. It didn't fit him. Well, the armor that Paul describes here is a custom fit. We are all unique. Many of us have very little in common. But one thing believers all have in common is our faith in Jesus Christ. And this armor is designed specifically and is guaranteed to work. For every person who has faith in Jesus, we just have to put it on. This armor has a number of elements, but the thing that holds it together is the belt of truth. What did Jesus say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. When we go into battle with the truth of Christ. Paul, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, says, We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. We take captive every thought to make it obedient to Jesus Christ. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. I'll tell you what, I don't feel very righteous most of the time. Thankfully, I don't face the enemy dressed in my righteousness because that would be disaster. But because I belong to Jesus, I'm dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless in the eyes of God, and therefore suited and worthy to do battle for him. I walk in shoes that are fashioned with the gospel or the good news of Jesus that brings peace to those I am retrieving from enemy territory. My shield is my faith, my faith in Jesus that protects me from a barrage of endless attacks from my enemy. I've been saved for this very purpose, and that is my helmet. All of those element, all of those elements are primarily for my defense. That should make an impression on me about just again how formidable is my enemy. I need all of that for my protection. But my weapon is my sword, the Word of God, the power of the Word of God. It is the power of the Word of God that crushes the enemy. The Word of God is the primary means that he uses to bring men and women, boys and girls, to their senses by helping them to understand the love of God and his deliverance that is available for everyone because of the cross of Jesus Christ. Finally, being suited with this custom-made armor and weaponry, Paul says in verse 18, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert. Always keep on praying for all the saints. We must be in constant contact with our commander-in-chief. This armor of God is unparalleled in the annals of armed conflict, but even this weaponry will be of minimal value to us if it is not supported by prayer. Desmond Doss is proof of that. How did he pray? Lord, help me get one more, one more. 
Listen to it from Private Doss himself. We threw hell, all types of high explosive demolition on the Japanese position. We decided it was only one thing left to do. We had 35 gallons of hard can gasoline and five gallon army water cans. Two men cut a hose, opened the can, let it up. Two of them literally threw it over the bank. The ammunition dump must have gone off. That whole mountain just seemed to quit even take anything to be able to slide it. But to our surprise, out came these Japanese from both sides for us. Showering Doss's battalion with artillery, mortar, and machine gun fire, the Japanese drove the majority of the group back down the face of the escarpment. But dozens of casualties were still left behind. I had these men up there, and I shouldn't leave them. They were my buddies. Some of my men were families, and they trust me. I didn't feel like I should value my life above my buddies. And so I decided to stay with them and take care of as many of them as I could. I didn't know how I was going to do it. Doss remained to tend the wounded, dragging them to the cliff's edge and attempting to lower them down the escarpment. But I didn't have enough rope to do the job like it should be done. Then the Lord brought to my mind that not I learned in West Virginia I'd never seen or heard of before. Relying on his childhood experience rescuing flood victims, Doss fashioned a special sling that enabled him to lure the men one by one to safety. So I just kept praying, Lord, please help me get one more, one more, until there was none left. Now the last one down. By nightfall, he had managed to rescue 75 fallen comrades. There's 15 of us got the medal that day. When my time came, I went up. President Trump, man, he came up and he stepped over the line and caught by my hand and shook my hand like an old time friend, somebody he'd been knowing all his life. He didn't even give me a chance to get nervous. <laughs> when you had explosives and bullets so close you could pack a favorite and not get wounded up there when I should have been killed a number of times. I know who I owe my life to as well as my men. That's why I like to tell this story to the glory of God because I know from a human standpoint I should not be here. You can't always win, but when your buddies come to you and say they owe their life to me, what better reward can you get than that? hard to understand me, but he said, I know who I owe my life to as well as my men. That's why I like to tell this story to the glory of God. When my brother comes to me and says, I owe my life to you, what better reward can you get than that? When we depart from this temporary life, what do you think we'll find most rewarding when we get to heaven? Will it be when someone comes up to us and says, boy, you made a lot of money on earth while you were there, didn't you? Or when someone observes, man, I must say, I, I'm really impressed with how, how skillful you became playing football or, or baseball or golf while you were on earth. Or will we find it more rewarding when someone says, you know, you played a part in retrieving me from the enemy and an eternity in hell apart from God. As Private Doss said, what better reward can you get than that? Let's pray together. Father in heaven, I think our tendency uh, so often is to 
float through this life, and uh, if not all the time, at least much of the time or part of the time, forget who we are in a sense in terms of our mission and we get sidetracked because our enemy who likes to play in the dark, who likes to mislead us in the dark, we don't recognize him and, and we get complacent and we uh, end up in places we shouldn't be. We lose track of, of our mission. Father, I pray that you help us to not just leave this place maybe hearing a little bit about this, but I pray that you'd help us to go back and, and remember over and over again whose we are and who we are in Jesus. Help us to commit this passage that Paul tells us about to memory, or at least uh, to uh, remember the basics of it, the armor that you've provided us with, the weaponry you've provided us with, Help us to love people, to retrieve people, to be involved in the lives of people who don't know you, just like Desmond Doss was there in Okinawa. Thank you for providing for us everything we need to accomplish our purpose in you. In Jesus' name, amen.